Okay. At least just another few minutes, Jim, and let a few more people. No in. problem. <laughs> no rush. And uh, maybe uh, Duncan give us a heads up for when uh, there's nobody else waiting to get in and we'll get started. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's not like you're trapped in a room. If I, if I waffle on or I'm boring you, sure you can always just dander off for a cup of tea and <laughs> come back in a minute and see if I'm talking about anything interesting. <laughs> Trust me, it's not actually an entire talk on like the, the archaeology of radar or the archaeology of Cold War. Do you actually have done that before? Eh? It's a bit of a change from the nine years war then, Jim, is it? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a change, all right. It's, it's a change. The territory, I think it was doing this around the same time, way back in the day, when we're back in the old Hill Street days. <laughs> sort of standing in battlefield heritage, battlefield archaeology and Defence heritage, some strange bedfellows, but sure, get you out for the day. Yeah. It was marvellous what you could detect from where things turned up and all the rest of it, you know. Strip. Oh, no, the, 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 this one actually got spoiled at the start because I was working with um, maps from the RAF Hendon, the RAF Museum. Oh, and yeah. So you have all, all the maps of the RAF and you're going, this is great, but just you had to find it, you know, and see what was there, and then go see what was left. But then, when you're done, when you're done the later stuff, you weren't served quite so well in maps, and you had to start working with what other people had published. And like, um, there's Andy over on uh, World War II NI and um, Wartime NI, and see what they have, and then you draw in everything that everyone else, you know, all the um, websites had identified. And then go field work with them and see what they are and record their condition and that sort of thing. And still, even we're on doing an entire research, see everything that the Defence Heritage pulled up way back in the Defence Heritage project. I had to visit all those sites as well. Like she's still got one or two of those to go. And is it all um, all out in the open now, or is there some kind of uh, restricted sites or anything? There is some sites, um, things like uh, Langford Lodge. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, because you know, it's got the Martin Baker, the ejector sheet people are up there and they prefer not to have photographs of their sites all over the place. So, yes, they are in as part of the Peroni, as part of the archive now. Mm. But are they just sitting out there for the public to sit and have a look at yet? No, not just yet. But yeah, yeah. That was yeah. a precondition of getting the survey done in there in the first place. <clears throat> right. It's uh, quite 25 to now. So, I think uh, we'll get started. So, uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, nice to see everybody here and hopefully some more people are watching on, on YouTube. So uh, welcome to everybody, members and visitors alike. Uh, before I introduce uh, our speaker this evening, can just remind you of our usual housekeeping rules, please. Uh, we'll just remind you that uh, this lecture is being recorded. It's also being live streamed on YouTube. So please make sure that you mute your mics and probably turn, turn off your uh, video as well, probably makes it a wee bit easier um, for you. Um, if you have any questions at the end, Jim has uh, said that he would be happy to um, answer questions at the end. So if you just type those into the chat function, please. Um, if you do that as, it does, as you're going along, as, as uh, various questions occur to you, that would be great. Um, thanks, Duncan, as usual, for setting up Zoom for us. And uh, hopefully you'll be dealing with any technical problems you may have. And uh, I think David's going to be keeping an eye on things as well. So thanks to them. Right, it's now my great pleasure to uh, introduce tonight's speaker to you, uh, Dr. Jim O'Neill. Uh, Jim worked has worked in archaeology for in Northern Ireland for about sixteen years. Um, we specialise in battlefield archaeology and uh, twentieth century defence heritage, and he's co-director of the archaeological contractors which provide specialist archaeological advice and skills to um, what was the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, Built Heritage uh, Department. Um, gained first class BA in modern history at Queen's uh, in 2007. And uh, that uh, encouraged him to carry on with his uh, academic career in, in history rather than archaeology. 
Um, so 2008, he jumped ship uh, to join the, um, the uh, history department at Queen's and his doctoral research uh, focused on military aspects of the Nine Years' War, um, otherwise known as Crohn's Rebellion. Uh, he got his MA at Queen's in 2009, followed by his PhD uh, in 2013. Um, he had a two-year fellowship at University College Cork in 2014, and uh, during that time he rewrote um, in his um, PhD into a monograph entitled The Nine Years' War, 1593 to 1603, O'Neill, Mountjoy and the Military Revolution, uh, which was published in 2017. I'm sure quite a few of you have probably got that. I'm sure it's behind me somewhere in the bookshelves here. So uh, since then, uh, he's been working as a heritage consultant for various public and private bodies across Ireland and was appointed Strike Monuments Council in 2019. And most recent project has been working with the Historic Environment Division uh, to re-survey the defence heritage archaeology across Northern Ireland, uh, which is the subject of tonight's lecture. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Jim. Uh, thank you very much. And um, you'll hear his lecture on bricks, steel and a lot of concrete. So thanks, Jim. Take it away. Okay, thanks so much, Anne. Um, right, what I'll do is I will start sharing screen so you don't have to look at my face for too much longer. Let's have a, make sure this works. Okay, you seeing that? Yep. Okay, great stuff. Um, okay, where do we start? Uh, one thing, I tend to talk too fast, so if I am, let me know. Um, but just pretend it's part of the whole vernacular Ulster language and that's, that's, that's just the way we'll take it. Okay, so um, Defence Heritage in Northern Ireland, the resurvey, where do we start? Um, let's see. Okay, right, it's working now. Okay, we'll say right from the start where it is, is that the, the foundations are really in the Defence Heritage Project, which uh, was run by the NAA, Northern Ireland Environment Agency Built Heritage in 1997 and it was part of the uh, Defence of Britain project under the Council of British Archaeology uh, and what it did it used volunteers uh, to identify and record sites all across Northern Ireland and it worked really real, well actually it was just filled with very enthusiastic people and ultimately they recorded what became the Defence Heritage record which covered uh, which had uh, details of 326 sites across Northern Ireland. Now what I was actually dealing with was uh, essentially four main periods of uh, conflict uh, related to Northern Ireland in the 20th century, and that's World War One, uh, 1914 to 18, World War Two, which was the biggie, uh, and 1939 to 45, the Cold War, which caused uh, certainly some puzzles in my uh, history history friends in the history department. Like Cold War, did that happen in Northern Ireland? Yes, it did. Believe it or not. Uh, and the Troubles uh, in 1969 to 98, which actually, when the project started, wasn't that long finished. Um, and this is what they came up with. Um, 738 points uh, all across Northern Ireland. As you can see, they're sort of clustered uh, over in the, the uh, uh, east of the country there. Um, and we always wonder, was that because more people, because it was Belfast centric, so a lot of people um, might have been come centering their research in and around there. But this is what we had and this is what we were working off. Um, uh, but there was issues. Now, the fact that you're working with volunteers, I cannot stress enough. It was when you actually start one of these projects, especially when the knowledge of the archaeology professionals was limited, to say the least, uh, when it came to defence heritage at the time, is what working with volunteers did is that it gave you access to a reservoir knowledge, just sitting waiting there to go. People like Ernie Crummy and the like, they just had a wealth of knowledge and they were happy to share. Um, but there's issues with it. And one of the issues was that uh, volunteers tend to be interested in what they're interested in. Um, and what I mean by that is that if you have someone who likes airfields, they'll give you everything that's to do with, they'll give you lots of information on the airfields that they know. Or, But if they're not that much into, um, to the defensive of the airfields, they're not going to really talk about that. Some were really into pillboxes, but but nothing else. Um, other people, they, they had only more areas of interest, and so 
you could have ended up with a quite narrow focus uh, on certain sections. Another one of the major problems they had is they had no rights of access. Um, volunteer or not, they just can't rock up and access land uh, willy-nilly, because uh, as you know, Northern Ireland and Ireland as a whole has quite uh, draconian land access compared to um, uh, in Great Britain. Uh, so they, 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 they were limited in the places they could go to. Um, and another thing we noticed is when they were submitting reports, they would submit these written reports, they didn't have a standard nomenclature that one person might call it a pillbox, another person might call it a strong point, another person might call it a bunker. And so you have all these loads and loads of different names appearing throughout the archive for essentially the same sort, same sorts of things. Uh, and sometimes, of course, someone would submit a report and it was just misidentified. Um, and also the way the reports were brought in or the way people were looking at things, it wasn't systematic. So you could have a really intensive amount of work that was done, say, in North Down, but nothing happened in Tyrone, or there, there just wasn't a step-by-step -step sequence. So uh, the, the coverage was patchy, which is really difficult when you're trying to inform, uh, uh, say, the department when it comes to management or uh, protection of these sites across the land. They don't really know what the entire resource is because it hasn't been systematic. And one of this showed up uh, very um, much, much later on, but in 2018, uh, the Loch May Landscape Partnership commissioned a report um, by me uh, to look at the uh, World War II airfields uh, on Loch May, specifically uh, Tomb and Clonto. Uh, and so when we completed that report, uh, well, when we started looking at it here, you can see one of the main problems is the under-reporting. Now what I'm showing you here, this is the map of uh, the defence area, the map of the defence area sites on Clonto, as was known, the Defence Heritage record uh, after the Defence Heritage project. This is shown on the, the Historic Environment Division's web mapper. Uh, and this one will, sh this is what the survey at Clonto under um, the landscape, the, the landscape partnership area showed. And as you can see, there's far more sites. Each one of those dots represents an individual feature. So, um, you can point out here there's the runway and then taxiways or power perimeter tracks but then all these things were um, either uh, synthetic trainers or the photographs here you have a double uh, bombing trainer and then here is a machine gun uh, the machine gun range that's down to the south end of the airfield none of this was recorded on the uh, defense heritage record only the, the single few points so clearly there's a deficit in knowledge now, this was really underpinned um, by the next year's report. It was the Benevena Coastal Lowlands Defence Heritage Mapping Survey, and that was done by the uh, Benevena Coastal Lowlands Landscape Partnership. Now, they got a uh, large funding from uh, the, the Heritage Lottery Fund to do the landscape partnership area up there. They uh, have promotion based on um, defence heritage sites and recreation, I think it was. And so they had me look at the defence heritage sites within a certain bound within the LP area of around McGilligan uh, and Benevena. And here you see Bally Kelly airfield and Limbo Body airfield, and you can just see a swathe of dots and features that just cover the airfields. And these are all the uh, dispersed living sites way out to the east of the main Limbo Body area here, the main Limbo Body uh, airfield area. And it's just the deficit of knowledge between what is out there and what was recorded in the defence heritage record was just shocking. And again, here, the Castle Rock chain home low radar site that was uh, initially represented by a single dot, but it was actually a whole uh, series of structures across the landscape. So what did they do? Um, based on another report, uh, they had a look at the shortcomings uh, or things that need to be amended to the Defence Heritage Record. They uh, commissioned a, um, the two-year survey uh, by me of to look at all Defence Heritage record and all the defence heritage features that can be found and recorded across all of Northern Ireland. Now the big problem, the big issue was that had to be dealt with first was the airfields. Um, now there's 19 airfields uh, across Northern Ireland that were built uh, either interwar or World War II and two flamboat stations. Um, so we dedicated an entire year just to those and then the next year was dedicated to resurvey of everything else in the Defence Heritage Record and then bring in everything else that we can basically find. So looking at the airfields, we had three um, 
pre-war in Northern Ireland, pre-World War II, sorry. That was Aldergrove, Sydenham and Newton Norge. And this one at the top here, that's the aircraft shed and type S sheds. And this is 1928, I think it's photograph was taken. These buildings are still there in exactly the same condition. And then down here, that's Sydenham. That's actually when Sydenham first opened. Um, and these two sheds, believe it or not, in amongst that whole complex of uh, between the Belfast Airport and Shorts, these two structures, though reclad, are still there. But in World War II is where you see the really rapid expansion. Um, the amount of construction that goes on during World War II in Northern Ireland, it beggars belief. They, because not just the RPs are getting built, everything else is getting built, pillboxes, the, the barracks. It, it, it really is mind bend. It's like the amount of concrete and steel getting poured uh, at this, at this busy six years is something else. But yeah, 19 RPs and two flying boat stations over uh, on Loch Iron. Now in that rapid expansion, you start, they just have built airfields willy-nilly. They, for one thing, they've got to be flat for obvious reasons, but they were built for the accommodate of different needs of different um, RAF commands. Um, we have fighter command, which was fighters, that's your Spitfires and your Hurricanes. Bomber command, uh, coastal command, uh, which is flying uh, coastal patrols up off the north coast uh, and from Loch Iron. Uh, there were only available Fleet Air Arm, uh, the United States Army Air Force, which had uh, six airfields uh, handed over to them uh, for their use uh, throughout the war. And here you can see the distinctive layouts. Normally they come in this uh, three runway layout and sometimes depending on topography uh, two uh, with their uh, surrounding uh, perimeter tracks. And we'll get into all the other things coming up. Now, what we do is I decided to jump in on the deep end straight away. And even though I'd already done a surveys of four airfields, I decided that for this project, I was going to busy cut and taste on Bishop's Court. It's one of the biggest, and it's got some of the most uh, uh, surviving remains of any of the airfields in Northern Ireland. So right, we'll, we'll jump in there first with both feet. And here you can see there's a photograph of it um, in the 1950s. And you can see there's the runways and the perimeter tracks. And then these are all the... Uh, uh, dispersed living sites, and this is the technical area where you have like the controlled hard training areas and what have you. Uh, and this is how it was recorded on the uh, Defence Heritage record map on uh, HED as it is now. Uh, and as you see, there's A dot. That was it. Uh, and more concerning for me is that's how it would also be seen on the climate hazard maps that a lot of this would feed into how you manage these things. So if you've got one dot, how can planners possibly consult you? on potential effects on the defense areas archaeology while well, they got us one dot in the middle of maybe 650 acres. This is what it is now. Um, there's 236 dots, I believe. And as you can see, what was once one dot here is now spread throughout the entire landscape. Uh, it covers the dispersals, the taxiways, the uh, uh, parking aprons. Um, and I'll actually go into so the nature of some of the buildings. As you can see, the impact on the landscape and correspondingly any development within that landscape have a much, much greater impact. Uh, and there's a much more substantial site than we'd ever be led to believe by looking at Defence Heritage Record, or sorry, initial Defence Heritage Record. So, what it was is a World War II UR field uh, and also radar site that had all. The, it, it retains a lot of the, the buildings that you normally come to associate with World War II RFs. See here, it's the, uh, the control tower. Actually, we want to be purest in the area. It's called a watch office. The Americans call it a control tower, but everyone recognizes the control tower. But if you're, if you're complaining about what we call the control tower, ask, tell someone else how to care. Um, but then you also have the other structures, like you have the night blind uh, equipment store and behind the control tower. That's where it had gooseneck blurs and that sort of thing that would have um, been used for night flying. Uh, the maintenance unit offices here, and then behind it, you have mundane buildings, just like the trains. Um, but you also had the, uh, the this airfield was actually um, retained in the in the RAF use uh, into the Cold War. So you see a juxtaposition of Cold War and uh, World War II sites in this photograph here at the bottom. You see that's the machine gun range, which is it's 25 yards machine gun range, and it was where uh, defense units would have practiced their uh, Rifles, there would be small arms range, and that's why you see how these, vent these ventilation levers at the back because they let the smoke out the back of the building. But you can see here, it's also just up behind it that's the uh, Cold War. Um, 
the transmission receiver bugger, a uh, essential for communication built in the 1980s. Um, so it's not just World War II, you see this overlay of um, defense heritage from different periods. And then here we have a Happy Drum operations block, which is, uh, was built to, to facilitate operations of a ground controlled intercept radar that was on the site during World War II and then was expanded into the Cold War and actually remained in use up until the start of the 1990s. Uh, and here is zero defense radar. Uh, this, this was in the 1960s, a uh, uh, large Type 84. It complemented the Ulster radar, which is actually over in Killard Point, uh, which is only about a, a mile away. Uh, and have the big Type 84 rotating radar. You have these uh, height finding radars. And how that actually remains in the archaeology today, these are actually the exact same structures at the bottom here. Uh, this one at the bottom is the, the modulator building uh, that you would have had to see this building here. That's the modulator building. It's, the exact same thing, only without the large radar model. And the high flying radars, you can see archaeologically they survive just as these round uh, uh, platforms is where basically the, the superstructures all being uh, pulled away, but this is the, the remains that are left. Then the whole site was upgraded in the 1980s. Now, when I say upgraded, um, this is the whole period when the, um, by the way, you need to like your brutalist architecture for this sort of phase. Um, this is when NATO decided mutual assured destruction is, is for losers. We're going for what they call flexible response. So it's sort of like a nuclear war. We could sort of win this. So rather than think of nuclear war, nuclear bombs drop, everyone dies. They decided the flexible response would be, they would reckon there would be like a, a gradation, a, a gradation of, uh, conventional warfare. And uh, so they decided that through that period, they, their sites would have to remain operational. So they hardened them with lots and lots of concrete and steel. Uh, and what happened here is the large building, the control and reporting post. This is where the uh, radar operators and trackers would have sat. The radar actually became mobile, so it didn't need that big radar that we had from the 1960s. It became a Type 93 mobile radar that could be put out into the countryside. But the um, radar operators had to stay static, so they were busy enclosed inside this concrete figure of a thing. Um, the walls uh, 50 to 75 centimeters thick. And that wasn't meant to be nuclear proof, but it was chemical weapons proof. And part of the uh, plant room here, you can see where the ventilators are. This would have sucked air in and uh, would have created an overpressure inside the building. It would have kept all your uh, nuclear dust and chemical weapons on the outside. So you can quite happily, don't think it's happily, but uh, work away inside and keep the planes flying. Uh, and this was supported with other stranger structures like this one that was up on the hill that you saw earlier. Um, and then this one with complement in the north end of the field. And these, as far as I'm told by people who work there, was the uh, transmitter receiver bunkers so that um, the operators and the control and reporting post can stay in contact with aircraft and with uh, sector headquarters in England. Um, but also working at this site, you had things thrown up that my experience just did not equip me to deal with, like, what exactly was this? And thankfully, through the popular wonders of the internet and people having published reports, uh, later discovered it's a thing called a commutated antenna direction finder. Yeah, and that's actually the easy word for it. Uh, and it was basically a form of um, direction finding, so that uh, a beacon that uh, they could find uh, aircraft that were carrying the right sort of equipment to quite sort of proper sort of respond. So it would allow uh, aircraft uh, to find the airfield. But yeah, I, I, I had trouble with that one. So what we did is we brought this on the, that, this methodology onto all the airfields and throughout the course of the year, and uh, just step by step going to them. And each, remember each one of these airfields, um, probably Albert Castle, Arsia, and all more, they all had single point entries on the Defence Heritage record. Um, so all these points um, were recorded that were they either extant uh, there were some remains, there were trace remains, so there was all something there. And what we had to, or what I had to do, was identify it, record it, and put it into the Defence Heritage Record, and then move on. And as you can see, the amount of dots that have turned up is just something else. It, it, it's it's beggar's belief. Really. Um, the kind of features we had, the classic ones that you always say, like I mentioned earlier, these are the, the control towers at uh, Clontoe. Limavari, uh, Bally Halbert and Langford Lodge. Um, they're all in 
a greater or lesser well, you can see what sort of condition they are some like Clontoe is in excellent condition very dry uh, inside and kept in excellent condition so too is the control tower at Langford Lodge this one has actually been listed years ago because it has a very strange all the windows are angled inwards aren't it something to do with uh, cutting down and reflections um, so they were the very obvious ones everyone who knows anything about the earth is would recognize the control towers but also we started to follow on to things like hangars and then you have a whole series of different hangars that, by the way, aren't used to store aircraft normally. They are where aircraft are brought for repair and maintenance. And then uh, when the crews are finished, when the maintenance crews are finishing, they take them out and they send them off to dispersals out further around the airfield. So you have these earlier types, this Bellman's, and then the Bellman was replaced. Apparently it, was, uh, it wasn't tall enough, so they created the T2s. And then you have these other, the Fromsons and the Blisters, that one's... That's Lima Valley, that's McGabbery, that's Eglinton, and this one's in Newton Arch. And then some of the, the you say, with the hangars, surely they, all the hangars look the same. Well, surely they can be. But I came across this, so this T2 is in McGabbery. And then we start to see sort of events uh, that happened during World War II, specifically the, the Belfast and the, this part of the neck of the woods. Up here in the remains and what this one was if any of you remember in 1941 when the Belfast Blitz happened the shorts actually took a bit of a hammer so what they did is they dispersed um, the final um, assembly phases of uh, aircraft in the different sites around Belfast and one of them was uh, McGabbery and so they actually went into the guy and the guy says oh there's, no, gonna, there's nothing in here like it's fine it's like well well, we'll see what there is anyway. It turns out this one it still has its original cladding, but more importantly, it still had its original gantry crane from 1941. There you see the name of it. Uh, he didn't tell me it worked or not, but the fact is that uh, a remaining gantry crane inside a hangar, which speaks to the whole assembly process of shorts and the Belfast Blitz, that's special in itself. But then it's not just the buildings that um, tell the stories. Also, uh, I've, I've taken photographs of lots and lots of... Uh, concrete, flat concrete over the course of this project, because each area of flat concrete in, in itself can tell its own story. And one of the things is the uh, dispersals. Now, pre-war, they thought they didn't really think that their crop would need to be dispersed. But when the threat of aerial attack became a real reality, um, they had to realize that they had to disperse aircraft around the airfields for their own safety. And initially, they had it on these fran pan. Um, you can tell why they're called fran pan. Uh, dispersals, but uh, so you get these early in the war, but then they realize that they aren't really that suitable because um, it, only one plane can leave the dispersal at a time. And when you have to turn them on their uh, on the carriages, it, it creates a strain that the aircraft weren't designed for. So then they moved over uh, 1941 42 into these spectacle dispersals, and uh, these ones here. And these were designed where you can just sort of drive the aircraft onto the dispersal and then straight off again. And then they could find out that, that they could actually uh, clear dispersals uh, much, much quicker. Uh, and then, sorry, the, these final ones, these finger parts, were, which you get far more here than you're doing in the cage, right? Uh, and they're a real symbol of the sign of the fact that there is no aerial threat anymore because these are uh, for dense concentrations of aircraft that get parked and stored. And uh, you get those at Lake Green Castle, uh, Langford Lodge, and Tomb and the like. Uh, and it really is for uh, dense parking. At one point in Greencastle, there's something, maybe something like 500 aircraft parked in storage. So yeah, they, they, these finger parks really speak to a time when the Allies have the air supremacy. Then you have things like synthetic training. Well, um, kids from today we call uh, or kids from today, my day, we call simulators. Um, what well, what we think was was done with the electronics. Uh, they managed in World War II with essentially murders and the lights. Um, um, what we we have pictures of here is a bombing trainer here, a link trainer there, a turret trainer here, a, a ground crew procedure center called GROPE for short. I'm not quite sure why they call it GROPE for short, and a gunnery training dome. And what these did is, like, say the bombing trainer um, used a moving projected map to let uh, a bombardier and, our, and pilot train together so they can drop simulated bombs on maps so they could. Busy, um, learn how to work together without ever leaving the ground. Um, and like this turret trainer taught uh, aerial gunners how to move, shoot at moving targets by having projected targets 
and instructors teach them how to shoot, how to lead aircraft you know, when shooting at them. And the ground crew, the same here with the, the gunnery training dome, was how to uh, ground the air fire. The, the group here, the ground crew procedure center, actually had an entire uh, fuselage of an aircraft in there, mocked up, and instructors would be able to have like um, simulated oil leaks or simulated uh, uh, fuel leaks or, or, or any any sort of accident or problems that air crews might have. They could simulate it so crews could get work together. So it was busy training on the ground. And then, of course, you had graffiti. I love the graffiti, actually, because it shows that even though there's momentous events happening around these places, um, what you also have is people. And when we're talking about people, we're talking about uh, young men uh, away from home and young men away from home. I find there's far more examples of this that just have to cut it down. And if you, is they just can't keep their hands to themselves and they draw over everything. Um, and these ones are ones from up in uh, Nimavati. Uh, and here we have the Coastal Command, the Mark III, is it Mark III or Mark II Gremlin, um, which is quite detailed, uh, doodle on the wall uh, and painted up. But also one of the, I, I quite like find it was one of the um, uh, maintenance units, again, in Nimavati. And there was me pencil doodles all over the wall. Um, it looked like it was done by the same person. It looked like it was in the same hand. And um, one of them was uh, this wee crest of a thing that they'd drawn up. And they were clearly mechanics because the, the crest said, you bend them, we mend them, which is clearly a reference to the pilots being not quite so careful with. Remember, aircraft are not the pilots' aircraft. It's actually the ground crew's aircraft. Why did they just lend them to the pilots? Uh, and then there was actually some posters, some aircraft identification posters uh, from World War II as well. Uh, but yeah, you find these graffitis all over the place, and it actually is quite poignant sometimes to see um, that these are young men uh, caught in abnormal circumstances. So sometimes they just while away their time, either carving their name in walls or writing their name in walls or as much cruder things as well. And then speaking to um, uh, the people that were uh, living and working there was the living sites. Now, you have to remember that they didn't live on the airfields. They worked at the airfields and they kept the aircraft at the airfields. But for safety sake, they actually had dispersed living sites around the airfields. And they normally they could be four, five, six, sometimes 10 or 12 of these as each small living site had uh, barracks and the pollution blocks and the trains. Uh, so you end up with like a whole series of buildings that you've seen again and again. This is up in the Nevada. This is in the trains. And uh, then there's an air raid shelter and there's an pollution block from Clinton. And then you're, um, you're uh, part of a Nissan hut here. Uh, this is at Kyrgyzstan. And again, this is Kyrgyzstan again. This is the pollution block. So yeah, as much as people go, oh, these are our fields with all sorts of military things. Most of the, a lot of the buildings you find are actually Things that cater to the domestic needs of people that actually live or live in there. Um, but also the fact is that it seems strange now to think, well, bombing attacks in our fields here. Well, it seems strange now because hindsight's twenty twenty. But back then there was every possibility. They feared that there would be air attacks directly on the uh, living sites in our fields, even uh, this far west. So uh, an awful lot of the living sites uh, are uh, fitted with these uh, air raid shelters. And again, they come in all series of different typologies. The of the single block air raid shelter with a blast uh, wall. There's just one single door here and an emergency exit at the back. Then you have the ones, these ones here, this one's from Mullet Moor. There's actually four chambers inside that, each with emergency escape routes through it. And then it enters both ends and blast wall. And then you've got this type, it's called a stamping shelter. And it's just pre-cast concrete. that would have had black brick doorways and covered with earth. Uh, and it was, this one was in Nuts Corner. Uh, and then this one here is actually in someone's garden in uh, Kyrgyzstan. So yeah, you, you, you can see all the different ty typologies of uh, air raid shelters by going through this project. And lots and lots of hot bases. Sweet Jesus, the amount of hot bases I've had to take over us all. And the fact is that you can't just go, oh, well, that's just a hot base and leave it at that. We're archaeologists and this is meant to be systematic. So everything gets numbered, everything gets recorded. And in this case, you had a whole fields full of hobbies. This is at uh, Omagabri, and there must have been a, a field there full of 70 different hobbies. This is essentially at the end of the war, someone came along and just scraped away all the uh, uh, nissen huts, all the, the, the galvanized steel and ribbon for uh, scrap, and just left the hobbies. It's just so we got grass over. Cows are quite happily munching away there alongside them. And like I say, this one here is even when you think you know 
that there's nothing there. Sometimes this project went again, but in the backside and told you don't presume quite so much. Because a lot of what this is having to do was uh, work with um, our photographs with, along with the maps. So you can just go and walk to everywhere where there is in the maps and see if something's there because we just don't have the time to walk over 600 acres for each site. Um, so you try and plot up from the aerial photographs, but in the case of this one, it cast large scale, which didn't look like there anything there because it was all heavily forested. And you thought, nah, the trees will all grow up and they'll, 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 oh, everything's been ripped out for uh, planting. Until, of course, they made the mistake of uh, actually going into the planting to see, just to be sure. And of course, inside the planting, we found a whole series of hot bases running right through the forest. Leaves all covered in leaf litter and, uh, and fallen uh, tree branches underneath here. This is actually uh, uh, the range of is actually you know, the short end. Uh, uh, and here it ran down through the trees. And there's a whole series of them running along. But also to, to add into that, we had a whole series of uh, open top uh, blast shelters that were surviving in amongst the trees as well. So even though we thought you knew what we were turning up to see, uh, quite often it ended up that um, uh, you, you, there was something else there. Um, our field defenses. Um, one of the things that they realized early in the war, well, they were taught by the Germans early in the war, that um, uh, one of the things the Germans would do is they'd land directly on our fields. Uh, so initially they built defenses around our fields, but then when they realized that the Germans would be very unsporting and land on them, uh, they had to create a whole new system of defenses that uh, essentially were defensive clusters that had a 360 degree arc of fire and they positioned them around the airfield so that the guns, there's as many guns pointing into the airfield as we're pointing away. Uh, and so how about that? I probably have more pillboxes on airfields than I have now on what you would imagine to an extent. You'd imagine pillboxes are more on beaches and that sort of thing, but no, uh, probably there's, I have more surviving pillboxes on airfields than anywhere else. Uh, and they come with different versions of pillboxes, which are just a single pillbox on its own strong points, which would be a series of um, pillboxes, uh, um, supporting trenches, seagull trenches, which would be just like a fire trench with these shelters. More than likely, they're quite low actually, so they're probably sort of used to keep ammunition. Uh, and these are all put together in defensive clusters. And again, like I say, just because I'm turning up, I didn't necessarily know precisely where everything was because sometimes the RAF were sneaky and didn't mark the defenses on their maps. But the one thing I did learn very quickly is that you make sure that you talk to the locals. Because if you think you're going to rock up and walk around and just know where everything is and not talk to anyone, you're doing the whole project at this service. And what happened in this one was that I was looking for one set of pillboxes and was talking to the neighbor. People, no, actually, the guy that owned the land there, uh, this is on the western side of Eglinton. Uh, and he said, no, that one's gone. But what about this one? I says, what one? And he pointed to this, which was in his rockery. Uh, and then this one here had his daughter's Wendy house set on top of it. And this was in the field next to it, which I'd been in several times, but he'd only cleared it in the last couple of years before this completely covered in so much scrub. You never know it was there. So there were constantly new stuff turned up. St. Angelo as well, which back in the, the tragedy of 2004, when the owner demolished 14 of them before uh, prior to scheduling. So we thought everyone's gone. Again, I was talking to locals, and the guy says, no, there's some up there. And I went up and talked to this uh, gentleman who's cutting his grass. And he said, uh, I said, excuse me, this might seem like a strange question, but have you got a pillbox here? And he went, have I got a pillbox? No, I've got three pillboxes. And so we went present to show me where these three pillboxes were, all heavily covered in foliage, but pillboxes nonetheless. So again, talk to the locals. We have some buildings that you only get in, in uh, World War II and can speak to some of the more um, uh, um, quite sinister uh, things that people were worried about. And this is the decontamination center. There was a real threat and a real uh, worry that uh, poison gas, these poison gas would be repeated in World War II. And so what we have, this is the gas decontamination center in uh, Lima Valley. Um, and it would have been, if there'd been a gas attack, this is where you would have went to remove your clothes and get cleaned. Uh, and get new clothes. Uh, and what we see here isn't a chimney, it's actually an air intake. And the reason why it's so tall is that mustard gas is heavy. And so this was meant to stick up, stick up above the gas cloud and draw in fresh air and then create an overpressure inside the building 
uh, that would keep the gas out. And here you can see it's actually still uh, not in situ with the original um, filter for that. Uh, the, the, now the old plant is gone, but the filter's still there. And as you can see, it's the port and air filter unit. Uh, if anyone knows anything about chemical weapons in uh, Britain, Porting Down is actually the uh, British government's centre for chemical and biological weapons research. It's all quite sinister stuff. But then when we finally finished with the airfields um, and got cracking with uh, everything else, uh, and then it started in the, the land defences, and we had to work with the Coastal Crust, which is what basically the defences on the beaches that would have slowed down uh, any enemy assault until uh, a response could be, could be organised inland. Uh, and you had defences on um, on the beach itself, uh, beach exits. You had things stop lines. There was nine stop lines in Northern Ireland, and these were uh, centred along, uh, lined along um, like the River Ban and the Neary Canal. And they had defence. All of the, all those bridges were being mined uh, and blown in the event of a German invasion. And then the defences were clustered around uh, one or two uh, crossing points, which in themselves were mined. So that if in fact it was going to fall, they would blown the bridge in the face of people attacking. But they realised that. Soon realised that defence lines were a terrible idea because essentially, as soon as you punch through in one place, the entire line has to fall back. So they created these things called uh, forward defence localities. Uh, Rathfa Island actually is one good example of it, where they created these um, 360 degrees defences around towns where you had uh, roads joining. So they they created there were forward defence localities or they were later changed the name to anti tank islands. They would act like uh, breakwaters for any I know stand in the way of an enemy advance. Then you have anti-aircraft defences. Um, we just, again, just jumping in here that they had four gun defended areas uh, in Northern Ireland. They had Larn, uh, the Iron, uh, Derry and Belfast. Uh, and we actually have a, survival, a, a much greater survival rate of heavy anti-aircraft defences here than, say, in Great Britain. I think we're working at about 20 to 25 percent surviving in some sort of condition, which is really high. I think it's about 10 or 5 in England. Um, I'm not quite sure why. Uh, but we have the, the and they all follow a, a very similar form. You have like a a group of four heavy anti aircraft guns uh, in a semicircle around the, the battery command, and then this is the battery command here. Uh, this is at Ed McGee, I think it is, uh, and then they got the uh, gun pits, um, and then you have as time goes on, you can actually see the design of these things progress. Uh, the ones on the east coast over around Belfast are much poorer quality uh, of design than the ones that built over inside the dairy gun defended area that are, are much higher specifications, much better quality. Um, you have the radar sites. Um, again, you have this first real technological war. Um, and of course, you couldn't have a radar network that spanned uh, Great Britain that, that missed out here, otherwise you're just creating a back door. So you have a whole series of set radar sites that work along different levels. You have the chain home, which would be the highest level, um, broad blanket type radar cover. The chain home low, which is these bottom ones here, which would have, uh, at the close of its name, it was actually uh, uh, trying to find, uh, we used to spot aircraft at the lower levels and the ground control intercept stations, which would have vectored uh, fighters on the enemy aircraft. And here, see, the, what we have here is, again, the chain homes would have had uh, uh, protected uh, sites and this one here just is the transmitter block up at uh, Castle Rock and this one's actually a Glen Arm. This chain home low block here is a Glen Arm and it's actually designed to be look like a, um, a bungalow with the chimney. That's, that's actually a fake chimney. But also it's not just the operational sites. Let know that uh, active defences, things like um, anti-aircraft sites, you had this massive influx of troops coming here. Uh, to train before going on to other battlefields. Um, what you're looking at here is training areas, which is bombing ranges, artillery ranges, mortar ranges, small arms, the whole lot. If you're going to train troops in the heart of it, this is where you're training them. And you have the, these were like anti tank uh, ranges up at Dunsevery, which would have had like a winding house. And this is actually a track that would have told a target dolly uh, for uh, anti, sorry, anti tank guns were fired at it. We also had small arms ranges. This one's up to Picari, which had things you'd expect. Like um, this is the markers gallery where the targets would have been marked. Uh, uh, that's why you have this big bank to protect the markers from the incoming fire. We had other other surprising things like um, the backstop behind it. Picari is absolutely dead. 
because this part of the bank is so heavily contaminated with lead and copper um, from the bullets that actually nothing grows. So then we had nuclear war. Uh, God, I once had a terrible argument with um, a colleague in history one time. She said, oh, the Cold War didn't happen here. Stop talking about it. It, 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 it happened in Europe. It, it was a global battle. So of course it happened here. Anyway, so they wrote it. If you're familiar with the Cold War, you know, the whole nuclear bring ship, NATO, Warsaw Pact. Uh, essentially, they fought out with proxy wars and they had the arms race. But how that affected here is that you had nuclear forces not necessarily deployed here, but they did have facilities built for the potential to have nuclear forces sent here. One of them was at Bally Kelly. And now this is the operational readiness platforms in Scampton in England. And here you had the V bomber force parked out on alert status. Now they expected that should the Cold War turn hot, these bases wouldn't last very long, so they created fallback bases. And these are the operational readiness platforms that they built up in Bally Kelly. This station, uh, Vulcan bombers, should they be forced to fall back? But also you have things like the Royal Observer Corps. Um, here now, okay. um, and they were a civilian organization that were housed in these small uh, Royal Observer Corps bunkers. Now there were 15 built in Northern Ireland uh, and the whole network of them across uh, all six counties. Uh, and these were three three man bunkers that literally in the event of nuclear war, they would have plotted uh, the height and the yield of nuclear explosions across Northern Ireland. They would have plotted um, uh, Basically, what height it exploded at the yield? That's why they had a, a thing like a bomb uh, pressure indicator, uh, and they would have uh, recorded radiation levels uh, and the wind direction or where follow would be the direction followed would go. And they would have passed all this information on to the Royal Observer Group headquarters, which was in an old repurposed anti-aircraft operations room in uh, Seatville Barracks, which is still there. Uh, and then that would have been passed on to the uh, sector headquarters in England. Um, and these wee small bunkers, they're, they're, they're really quite cramped. They only had, there's three people in it, but only two bunks. And they were fitted, I think, for so like 14 days. They were expected to operate. And then once your 14 days of water was up, that was it. That was it. There was no more. And um, what happened after that, I, I, I don't think that anyone had planned any contingencies, certainly nothing I've ever heard of. So, how do we protect and manage these things? Um, was well, one of the things that, um, they had me doing was not just recording these things, but actually identifying the issues. Now, dereliction, they've given the age of these things, they were only meant to be temporary. You can imagine uh, that um, wind, weather, and time is uh, always a factor, but also you have contamination. There's huge amounts of asbestos. As far as I'm told, it's the good asbestos, it's the uh, compressed asbestos cement. Here's stacks of the stuff um, at uh, Lima Valley, uh, which is apparently okay as long as you don't start breaking it up, but there's a huge amount of it. Um, with things like hangers, um, certainly they're not being maintained. You can have uh, panels start to fall off, and once the wind load, wind starts to get in behind those, it starts to strip off panel after panel. So they can remain intact for a long time, but as soon as there's a gap in uh, the panel, uh, they can start to fall apart. You can see this one's the, the wind is taking its toll on this Frompson hanger up in England. Um, and again, this was a parachute store I photographed in 2007 at Mullock Moor. And this was it last year. And you just see the, the, how quickly once they start to degrade and uh, how much, uh, how quickly they just start to vanish. Vandalism and also a weird issue. This is uh, one of the load barn walls, seeing it's up in um, the control tower at Limavati. And for some reason, locals, kids I'd imagine, uh, were taking a lump hammer to this wall and just kept knocking parts of the wall down. So eventually the wall is going to fail. I actually found the lump hammer there and actually took it home. Hopefully the lack of a hammer would make them stop doing it, but why are they doing it? I don't know. Uh, vegetation is also an issue. This is a photograph I took of the same control tower actually in 2004. And this is a control tower in 2019. Uh, it's, you can imagine, the problems is that, that, that that's creating. Um, we have field clearance, something that comes up that uh, farmers can do. There, there's no requirement for planning or anything like that. And sometimes a farmer just decides, I want to get rid of that. Um, and certainly these uh, dispersal uh, brand plants up in the valley. I was actually chatting to this farmer and he says, I thought I'd just take them away to get money for the hardcore. And then it turned out they didn't really get much for the hardcore and there's nothing grows on it anyway. So he says, but she never bothered. 
and others with stones of the Kirkstown Fighter Pen. It turned up just in time to see it getting flattened out. Uh, and the farmer said he just wanted an extra half an acre. Uh, and this can happen. There is there's no control on it. There's no uh, there's no uh, not, there's not the equivalent of planning for that permitted. Um, so these things can just vanish without any ability to, to uh, preserve them. But what I actually did find was a ridiculous level of um, reuse, that, or a fantastic, I must say ridiculous, a fantastic level of reuse that I didn't expect to find. Um, over here, these were the uh, holiday shell. These were the old barracks, actually 1950s barracks from uh, Bishop's Court, and every single one of them has been turned into a holiday home or house. Uh, this is an old mess up at Eglin, which is that the, this part of a whole technical area, or sorry, a whole communal area that's been re, repurposed in the light industry. And for, for people who used to tell me for years that you couldn't reuse things, this puts a total idea that, that they are eminently reusable. This is actually one of the more imaginative ones. I couldn't believe it when I saw this. This is an old bomb aimer. Now, this is the body of the synthetic bomb aimer from Clanto. And then the owner sort of extended out in order to give himself more living space. But he said he didn't want to destroy part of the heritage fabric. You no, know, he, he, he was very um, uh, forward thinking. They, they believe that we're basically custodians and we don't really have the right to go around wiping everything out and putting our armor. So he wanted to keep it because he knew it had a historical resonance. Uh, and again here, this is where the control tower but Mullet Moore has been converted into a house. Um, and it's actually the guy that was living in it. Sorry, he passed away quite recently. Um, he'd actually worked on the airfield um, when it was operational. And here's another one of the old uh, Grand Crew Procedure Centre in Clontow again, where the landowner said he didn't want to demolish, even though the half the building was gone, he didn't want to take away the brickwork. So we created a new shed inside the brickwork of the old, so that basically the new, what he needed, the new could work alongside the, the old without having to strip, take it all away, which is a fantastic way of going. Um, all it just needs is a bit of imagination and willingness to do so. So we just kept on working on this project and just the buildings kept coming and coming and coming and I, 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 I keep slugging away at it. And these are like uh, the bomb fusion houses up at Mullet Moor. Uh, I'm sorry, getting ahead of myself, previous. Um, they got the radar site of a blackhead that wasn't previously recorded. You cannon butts at Eglinton, bomb stores at, at uh, um, Castle Arsdale. Uh, all in fantastic condition, really, really good condition, and all not previously recorded individually as part of the, the transparency. So, uh, and so how's this all added up? Here's where we are so far. This is where we are since this morning. Um, previously, like I said, we had um, 700 odd points, and uh, now they've been rationalized, and everything else, every, all these points have now all been individually uh, recorded and identified, and all the rest of that. Now we're on uh, 3,826. Uh, it's also part of my brief to recommend for scheduling. So there's about 152 features I recommend for scheduling, about 48 for listing. Whether they go for that, whether it's not up to me, it's not only recommended. Um, it's up to the HD architects and archaeologists to decide whether they'll actually go forward for listing or for scheduling. But it's a big, big, big uh, step forward from where we were. Um, but the, the project's ongoing and um, I'm set to keep going till August, and I imagine we're going to breach the 4,000. Uh, and even then, there's still more with that. I doubt I'm going to get to the end of the list and go to real that's me done. But certainly when it comes to moving forward, what we know about uh, uh, the, the defence heritage landscape in the Northern Ireland, certainly uh, HED have all done as a great service by having this work done. And certainly will. it'll help feed into people's idea of what there is, and hopefully then they can grab it and move forward and do even more work on a local level. Okay, thanks very much, that's me. Jim, okay, was... and any questions? <laughs> that was brilliant, Jim, thank you so much indeed. Um, no I'm sure uh, uh, a lot of people will have uh, seen, you know, oddments of, of uh, military installations around the countryside without really knowing what they are, what part they played or potentially played uh, during the world wars or indeed later as you said uh, during the cold war threat so uh many thanks indeed i think it's an absolutely mammoth project and you're very much to be congratulated in, in getting this information gathered together so that um people will be able to learn more about our, our defense heritage so thank you very much indeed okay. um, 
no, I think uh, you said you would answer a few questions. So we'll have oh, we to stunned see. in the silence. <laughs> All right. Well, we've, we've got one here from uh, Stephen Cameron. Uh, mm -hmm. He says, given the importance of Lauren Harbour during World War I and World War II, I'm surprised at the lack of sites recorded in the current Defence Heritage database. He, he's come across at least a dozen sites not recorded and uh, he's offered to... Um, put now, which sites are these now? Uh, this is in Larn, the Larne Harbour area. Larne Harbour area, right. The only ones we've got in Larne at the minute, I think I'm at Larne tomorrow. Um, uh, they got parts of the old battery at Larne and they got the Mulberry Kizions, I think, are in the thing. But we can only really work with what is available or what people bring these at the minute, because they don't get as much time. No, a lot of it's coming from, um, say, World War II and uh, wartime heritage. So if, in fact, he knows of any sites that um, he wants us to have a look at, um, I'm more than happy for him to send them to me, and I'll put them on the list to get uh, looked at. Well, that sounds good. We'll have to uh, get Stephen in contact with you then. Uh, Absolutely. I'm more than happy to do that. That's that's that's, that's what we encourage, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, and he says it, at least a dozen sites not recorded, so um, that ought be something to... A dozen provide. sites? No problem. We'll get those. We'll have right. a look at those and get them in. Very good. Now, any more questions from anybody? Well, one or two, um, one or two things I've been wondering by my, myself. Um, there's a vast amount of, of land was taken up um, with these various installations. Was the land vested at the time, or compulsory purchased? And to what they, yeah, they, has they just basically turned thing? up and they said, "We're taking this. Yeah. Here's the money. Be gone yeah. in a week." Yeah, um, it, and it's still actually causing there's a, even to this day you will go to places like Tomb and certainly Greencastle. Where you will still get a lot of uh, bad feeling. Yeah. Uh, certainly about a lot of the way the land was restored as well. That sometimes they went to people and said, "Oh, well, you can have your land back." And says, "Well, what do you think I've been living off?" No, they didn't have the money to buy the land back because they had to use it to live off when they yeah. were put off their land. So then mm -hmm. some people came in with uh, money and bought up land that previously wasn't uh, perhaps traditionally there. So you can still get a lot of bad feeling in there. Certainly in tomb. Because the parish got split when you when they put the airfield in, um, and um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, certainly it's quite strange in him that they um, have more fond recollections of the Germans than the Americans, because they found that the Americans stayed to themselves, whereas the Germans prisoners of war were made to go out and work on the farms. Okay. So there's a more there was a more personal connection with the Germans and the Americans. It's quite strange. Wow. And sometimes it, it, it things go quite differently than you'd expect. Yeah. Anybody got a question for Jim? Hello. Just on, on the subject of Lorn, something that might interest you is mm. <clears throat> that when Lorne Harbour was developed after the Second World War, they used a prototype mulberry, mm -hmm. which, which was towed over from Scotland. Yeah. Uh, and they sunk that and that formed the key, they built columns on it on the deck and that served Larne Harbour for 20, 30 years. If it's of interest, when the key was redeveloped, the mulberry was floated again and to move it, it had to get a certificate of seaworthiness from Lloyds of London and it was given or sold for one shilling at the time to a chap in Carlingford who was developing a marina mm -hmm. somewhere in Carlingford over on the Louth side, that mulberry was sunk as part of the boundary wall, boundary uh, protection for his marina. Mm -hmm. Maybe outside your jurisdiction, but an interesting... If I'm not wrong, do they still, is there still one of those mulberries still sitting in Lauren Harbour? Or just, if you just, when you're going to um, current point, just on the right hand side, there's meant to be something still sitting in the in the water. Someone, uh, just, uh, I think that was meant to be reported as one of the mulberry. Pass. I've I've, I've no knowledge of that. Uh, I had photographs of the the mulberry when when it, when it was raised, uh, yeah. and a surveyor came over from London to give it a a seaworthiness certificate. 
Yeah, I'll shoot you next year too. It's the, the kind of thing that these things are always uh, popping up. We'll shoot you. Actually, I'm going to there tomorrow, actually. Um, bear with me just a wee sec. Uh, New York, aye. Um, and it's, it showed up in the area of photographs just off. Uh, I'll share this. Um, share screen. This is just up off. Know where the, um, what do you call the convent there? It used to be a convent. The oh, I don't know. These, these are kind of photographs. I was telling you about the Dramalis, the convent, Dramalis. That's it. And yeah. this is this is in their grounds, and that's what I'm going to visit tomorrow. Can you see that? No, is that not showing up? Sure, isn't it? It is showing us. Oh, is it? So you see all the, those hot bases? Yep. That's all still rough ground in Dramalis. And so the kind of thing in this project we ended up doing is you end up going to the rough ground with like a, I have like a steel probe and you just go bunk, bunk, bunk. And an awful lot of the time, these things are all showing up under the ground. So what they've done is they've just grassed them over. And certainly on the aerial floor grass, where those hot bases are today, it's still just rough ground. And so we'll be out visiting tomorrow to give it a, a quick poke. Uh, and that, that's also a lot of what's happened at um, Langford Lodge is when we went there and there's all the big the, the finger just park dispersals that went up to the north of the airfield. And then if you look at that, that's all just grass. But then the uh, aerial photographs came out, I think it's 2017, 2018, um, when it's another really dry summer. And then just to the parch marks, it was all the dispersals all just turned up. And it turns out that all the dispersals are still exist just under the grass because the farmers re realized it's far harder to pull, pull up the concrete and cover it over with another layer of topsoil. So they covered with topsoil rather than lifted. It. So it's the whole network is all still there. Just one, one last wee last wee point again <clears throat> that uh, a mulberry should end up in Carlingford Lock uh, as the result of the Second World War. And the, towards the end of the First World War, they were building concrete ships on the other side of Carlingford at Warren Point. They had a wee shipyard there. Uh, to build concrete ships to bring iron ore from Spain because 1917-18 uh, stocks were running out and as far as Britain was concerned. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether there's any <clears throat> any keys at Warren Point or any slips that are that are left from, from that. The, 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 there's so much still there and so much will end up chasing. All up and down. At the minute, I'm still working off things that I actually know was there, and I'm not going to get that. That's the worst thing at the minute. Is that I've got a list of like still um, of 40 sites in Derry, and we're working through about 10 to go, no, 11 to go to tomorrow in uh, Mid Andrum. That to get into research and trying to find out where there is more, they just haven't got to the stage. You just haven't got that luxury of time at the minute. Um, the thing is, I would love to actually go through systematically go through you know, all the aerials, you know, the 1946-47 aerials, and identify sites. What that's what I managed to do for some of the um, uh, houses like Castle Cool and Fermanagh, and all, rather than go on the ground because I just haven't got the time. Is I'll identify the uh, living sites from the 1946 aerials and use that to put no pinpointed as an area of oh, this is where the hot water, no, this is where the sites were. And then move on from just so that we can get some sort of record down because just time is so short. Um, actually, I, I did actually notice that it, um, Alistair Lings mentions about the Maharmina Beacon near Belig. We've got the it, we got the it last uh, about three weeks ago. Thank you. Any more questions from anybody? Whoever says there's two underground bunkers in Dramalis, please contact me. And, uh, and let me know where they are. <laughs> So definitely, I think we need to get in contact with them. Um, I, I was wondering, um, have you had any opportunity to use LIDAR in sites like Castle Archdale, or is that sort of beyond the budget at the moment? That's that's beyond me at the minute. I have had some nice people come to me with some lovely LIDAR uh, images. Um, certainly, uh, Heather Montgomery had some nice work done at Valley Kenler. And uh, Malaga Conway with the National Trust had some lovely work done at um, 
well, where was it? At Murloc. And it was lovely. It showed up very nice. No uh, World War II section posts, things like that. Clear as day. So that's what I'm saying. When this information is out there and there is all these dots all over the place, I'm hoping that some will go, that's just the place where light are. Fill your boots, please. Because with that sort of focus, you'll definitely get more than I got. Uh, that I just don't have the you know, like I said, don't have the time to actually do that sort of thing. But hopefully, this is a busy just one building block on of work that will come later. Will, will there be listing? Will there be listing the nuclear fallout shelter at Balamina? It's scheduled. It doesn't need listed. Is it right? Mm -hmm. right? It's scheduled. The is the war room in my Eden. It's listed. Right. Are there many sites that are at least scheduled? I have, uh, what did I have there? Uh, 147. Uh, and that, that, that's me being fairly okay. But to tell you, 147 out of 3,800 points, that's about what you would get for, you no, know, I think it's for field monuments. I think they run at about 4 or 5%. So that's pretty much working along what you'd expect. Anyone else? Got some more questions. David, can you see any more questions there? I... Has a similar project? No, a similar project hasn't been done on the south. Um, if anything, um, I was actually talking to some colleagues in the south. Uh, for once, you know, with the south, they have all their Bruna Born and all their fabulous Neolithic and Bronze Age, and they sort of go, How, We've got the best stuff. You know. But no, this the, when it comes to defense heritage, we can lord it like kings over them. Yeah. And uh, say airfields, I'll show you airfields. Pillboxes, the, the pillbox, they have pillboxes down south, but one, they're terrible in design, uh, and two, we've got lots more. Uh, so, for once in the archaeology world, we, we can stand as kings and go, look at all we have, uh, and lord it over them, uh, and not be very generous. But no, they they uh, they they know it's an issue, uh, but how they move forward with it is another matter. Um, hopefully, there's meant to be a conference. In fact, there is going to be a conference. Um, later in the year, I think it's December, uh, in Dublin, and hopefully that can be used as a kickstart for some sort of progression along the lines that we have uh, to get their defence heritage like that. Because at the minute, I think it lives in a limbo world of it's not archaeology and it's not architecture, so it falls down the cracks of any sort of management or protection, which is uh, not good. Mm. But when you're out and about, do you find generally that you know people consider um, defence heritage as being um, valuable or as valuable as other um, more ancient field monuments, or do they just see it as just big lumps of, as you say, concrete and, and brick and steel in, in the landscape? Generally speaking, people are pretty cool about it. Generally speaking, they they sometimes they don't know what it is. Sometimes they know it's something to do with the war, but don't know what about the war. Um, but I find possibly more appreciation of it than say more traditional archaeology like Rast and things or Stantonstones because I think Can a lot of people they identify more with it they know what it is and it's you no know, it's sort of more in their recent past and probably they might have known someone that's had something to do in the war or something like that and so they get a better appreciation or they have a uh, a better I don't know it, it just it, they relate more to it um, and no, this is not to say there's not ones that I've had more than enough farmers say, is someone going to give me any money to take that away? And I go, eh. a lot of the time they'll just say, they'll know what it is, but didn't realize it had any sort of uh, heritage value or any sort of archaeological importance. And to tell you the truth, all it's actually taken, there's another reason why I talk to everyone on my there, is uh, they just need someone to say, here, this is of interest. We People do consider this you know, part of our you know, uh, ongoing you know, the uh, heritage uh, and sure if you're not doing anything with it could you just make sure that nothing bad happens to it and go oh, all right that's fine mm -hmm. and that's a sort of like soft hand of engagement no, it's, no you don't yeah. need to be turned with a big stick going i'm protecting this and i'm protecting that just sort of a, a quiet word in the ear is normally all it takes jim there's a couple of questions coming in there from youtube uh, uh stephen cameron also says there's three mulberries still at larn the youtube question is from a guy called alistair lings he says, I believe there was a navigation beacon at Macher and Mina 
Yep, there was. Uh, construction to help flying boats use the Donegal Corridor. Do you know um, if anything has survived there? And we were there three weeks, and there is stuff there. Yep, and it all got recorded, so it's all good there. We got we got uh, Marhamina covered. The underground bunkers are miles. Someone tell me, please, because I'm calling out there tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> similar project. No. Uh, would the schedule on Balamina put off any potential buyers? That's a matter for potential buyers, to tell you the truth. That's not really... The only thing I could recommend is it, it's heritage value, um, how it, how we should proceed with its protection, what I would recommend. And to tell you the truth, it was actually scheduled for protection before this project even started. Because you got to remember that there's no building like that anywhere on the island of Ireland. There's only three in the entire UK. So... On, again, on rarity value alone, if you had any other structure that there's only one like it and unique in this part of the world, you, this is how you go forward. You can't just go, oh, but it's ugly or it's recent or whatever. That really doesn't have any bearing. Uh, a thought that occurred to me, to, to Jim, was it was it, were, were, were all these um, installations actually built by military personnel or did they use local contractors as well? Oh, God, no, the local contractors were coining it in, absolutely minting it in. The, um, <laughs> I think the factory down south, no, the, the, that concrete factory in Drahada was working overtime. The, mm -hmm. um, everyone had their hand out and everyone was getting paid. The amount of uh, corruption in the construction was just eye-watering. Um, one of the things it's that we find, then. oh, it was just nothing's changes. Um, one of the things that we find, uh, it happened at every airfield that I can see because they all have the same stories is that people were paid, say, for the concrete load, and so they just kept coming in the gate and going back out, and then coming in the gate and getting paid for another load and getting paid for another. <laughs> and the other ones is that if something a lot of the time, it's certainly in Clinton, we find this is it, say, if uh, one of those big concrete hard stands, you know, the big brown pans. Mm -hmm. It only needed to be like six inches thick on a bed of hardcore. But then when they went to cut into them, they were, someone wanted to build a house, they realised that they were nine inches thick or 12 inches thick. They were just pouring far, far more parts of concrete than was ever needed in its construction. So, yeah, there were there were civilian contractors and they were, on the most part, there was some military construction. But uh, on the most part, for that amount of building, you, you, it's civilians doing the building. And you got to understand it's Whenever you look at all this, imagine all of this getting built all at the same time. The amount of construction uh, going on, the, the roads must have been full of concrete lorries. Um, because the, 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 the easily you could say, you could say this one period, certainly in Irish history, is definitely the most intense phase of civil engineering in the history of this island. Jim, it's David, it's David Craig here again. Yeah. Uh, whenever I was doing the Spartina survey, I was trying for law, came across uh, the uh, some anti-landing posts at the sewage works between Utenars and Cumber. I think I yes. reported it, but I can't remember who I reported it to. I don't know if I ever got as far as you or not. It's okay. Uh, They're on now. Right. They, they, they went on to the um, intertidal survey, I think, might have picked it up. Yeah. They uh, were so there. Yeah, there on. Yeah, there were anti-landing posts, I think, further up near the airport, but these are down near the sewerage works, right opposite the sewerage works. So I think, hold on a wee sec there. But the handy thing about doing this on the computer with several screens is I can check right now and tell you. Um, let's see. Burr with me just a wee sec here. I'll just load this up. Um, I, the inputting thing, they, they set me up with this survey, one, two, three, you know, for input and all the data. Uh, it's fantastic. You just, just fly through the stuff. Uh, we got the survey. We got the anti land poles up by the airfield, but down by the sewage works where there's the pillbox. Yes, where there was the pillbox. Yes, yeah. yeah I, but... I know we don't have anything there. So if you want to actually send on to me um, yeah. sort of a there, grid reference or something like that, I'll get it checked out. There's a double row of angled posts there. I think I have photographs. Tell them, maybe send them to you. Punt them on to me and I'll get a dot on for it because. Uh, Basically, the more we know, the more we can manage, the more we can protect, and the more we can make sure they stay where they are and nothing bad happens. Grant. Right. Anybody, any final questions? No? 
Okay, well, that really remains to say thank you so much indeed again, uh, Jim, for a really fascinating insight into our more recent past. Um, it's been absolutely excellent. I mean, I'm sort of fairly familiar with the, the type of monument you're talking about, but I think even I'm well surprised at just how much does still remain. And uh, certainly if anybody is aware of, it, of anything, um, by all means, check out the uh, Defence Heritage web, uh, website. Um, and uh, let uh, either let us or, or let Jim know if, if you find or anything new. Quite happily contact me directly on my email, um, jmneil30 at qub.ac.uk, and I will more than happy. You say you just contact me, send me what it is, and if you can send me a uh, grid reference, no, you can get it off right clicking on, say, no, uh, Google Earth or something, they'll give you the, the Latin longs, and I'll check it out. And if it is what it is, then it'll go on to the DHR. Oh, no problem with that. Very good. Well, thank you again so much no indeed. And uh, thank you everybody for, for listening in. And uh, I'm sure there's lots of people on YouTube likewise have, have enjoyed it very much indeed. So uh, it's just great. Thank you so much indeed. Oh, thanks it, very much. It, it remains really just to uh, let people know about our next event, which is 20th of June. Uh, we have a workshop on animal bones. Um, we're very limited in numbers. Um, but if you're interested in that, um, if you could uh, contact our um, OnSec uh, Ken Pullen, um, if you'd like to attend. I'm not sure how many people um, are signed up at the moment, but uh, it's certainly worth making an inquiry um, via Ken, please. And our next lecture is on the 27th of June when uh, Dr. E. Campbell will be talking about um, idols, arts and severed heads. 3,000 years of deposition in a lost common fen, and uh, details of that will follow in due course. So um, just remains to say thanks again, Jim, and uh, thanks everybody, and hopefully we will see you um, at the next lecture. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, honey.